Hi, welcome to Reading Greek Tragedy Online. I'm Joel Christensen from Brandeis University, and I'm here with the Center for Hellenic Studies, Out of Chaos Theater, the Cosmos Society, and our special guest of the day, Erica Weiberg. And we're proud to introduce you to a new original play by Chaz Libretto with music by Kim Sherman and performance by uh, Bettina Joy de Guzman on the, called the Le Leao de Mead. Um, now, this play is based on a lost play and a story cycle um, that shows up in uh, Euripides' uh, fragmentary that Protus allows. I'm really happy to have Erica today to help me understand or help us learn a little more about what the background is um, for this pretty fascinating story. Um, so, Erica, where are we in this play, sort of in the myth and the lost play um, generally? What's going on and, and where can we situate ourselves? Yeah, so we know from the Iliad, from the catalog of ships actually, that Protesilaeus is the first, by far the first, Homer says, to jump from the ship onto the shore at Troy. And he's also therefore the first Greek to die at Troy. And um, that's really all we learn about Protesilaeus from the Iliad. We probably, the, the Cypria, another epic cycle, told the story as well. Um, but we also know that Euripides wrote a fragmentary what is now a fragmentary play um, on this story. And in this story, he introduces the relationship between Laudamia, who is the wife of Protesilaus, who was married to him only for a day before he had to leave for Troy. And then um, we learned that after he was the first to die at Troy, um, she found out about it. We think that based on you know, reconstructions from later stories, that what happened in the play that Euripides told was that um, Protesilaus came back from the underworld to have one single day with Laodamia. So there's a lot of um, single day motifs going on here. Um, so he had one single day with Laodamia um, after his death. And then after that, um, the story goes that um, Laodamia died by suicide because she couldn't bear to be parted from Protesilaus. So it's a nice light tale for Wednesday. Yeah, nice, nice light tale. <laughs> so, I mean, this is one of those stories that fills Greek myth that I always forget about. Right? There's almost something sweet to it. There's something maybe a little sinister, um, but it's based on this first this first figure. Protus allows, he dies, he goes back. And there, there, there's an Orphic aspect to it almost, right? So reverse Orpheus, the guy trying to get home. Um, we don't have this play. We have a summary of it. Um, it's not one most people know about. What in the story attracts you? Like you hear this story, what makes you want to talk about the story of Laodamia to people? Yeah, I think, well, there's some other um, literature from antiquity that imagines Laodamia's perspective. So Ovid does this in his Heroides. And I think that um, thinking about it as, as um, Chaz Libretto's play does from Laodamia's perspective is an interesting one. What, what was it like for her to have been married to someone for one day, have them leave for war um, and die there? What I mean, what, what was that experience like? Um, what was the grief of that experience like, which is is not a not a straightforward grief, I think, because it's someone that she probably didn't know very well, um, but was with for a single day. Um, and you know, then what was what typically happened in the ancient world was that if if your husband died in war, then you were if you were of marriageable age still able to um, have children, then you would be remarried almost immediately. And so, um, so that kind of experience, what was it like for her? I think is an interesting question. Now, as someone who, who works on performance in Greek tragedy, um, would you care to speculate on what was in Euripides' play? Like it's Chaz Libretto um, tapping into something you think was there in the myth, um, or was Euripides interested in something different? I know this is a wild question that's unfair, um, but what do you imagine? Yeah, I, it's hard to say because the sad thing about um, the fragments of this play is that they're mostly, because of the way they were preserved, they're mostly these um, kind of gnomic statements, which means statements that are just kind of ancient wisdom about things. And, um, but there are a couple of interesting ones. Um, one of them is this really misogynistic few lines about how, um, I guess I could read them, um, how, a man who takes on troubles for the sake of having a wife seems to me stupid um, and simple-minded for a woman merely acts as a host to his offspring. 
Um, so maybe Laudamia's father said that. It's unclear what the context is. And then there's a kind of response maybe by, by Laudamia herself defending women. Right. Um, and, that, and that's the one where she says, I think, anyone who lumps all women together in slander is unsubtle and unwise. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's something um, the play, as Euripides often is interested in his plays is, you know, what is the status of women in society? Um, what is their role um, in society? How, how do they um, what is how do women um, properly act as wives and mothers? Um, so those kinds of questions you see in other European plays, and they must have been of interest in this one as well. Um, I think another thing that will come out in, in the Chas Libretta's interpretation here is this idea of a, um, was there a statue of, um, of Protoseleus that, that Laudamia became attached to? We hear about that in Ovid, we hear about that um, in the summary, this later summary, which we don't know how much of that is from Euripides or not. Um, but it's interesting to think about um, the story about her being very attached to this, this image of him um, after she finds out that he's died um, and sort of having a relationship with the image. Yeah, the and, and some of the later receptions are, are much less kind than you with the word attachment, right? <laughs> <laughs> I guess, but, it, yeah, that was being a little prudish. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and, you know, there's something about the context or basically the setup of the play, which is very, I could see why you were be drawn to it, right? It's like, imagine one day only with, with your spouse. What do right. you do? But we don't even get that, right? Instead, what you get in, you know, in what we think we know of the fragments is this argument, right? The setup that you never really get there. Um, before we get to the performance, we do have um, the perfor performer, um, Bettina Joy de Guzman here. Um, so Bettina, I, I know you do a lot of the music in this performance and won't be here after to talk to us about it. Um, so do you want to take a few minutes just to talk about like your view of the myth and why you were excited to do some of the music for it? I, I would love to. So, uh, you know, I was so excited to do this because I, I'm all I have is the script. I ha was not here for the rehearsals. I was not able to. So all I had was the, you know, the music and the script to go with. And to me, it's, it was so fabulous um, working on the on the music for this because I could see how uh, each scene was really be, was being drawn out by the simplistic, uh, simple lines of the of the melody. So like just the just the various scenes, um, even the, especially the very ending. I don't want to, to spoil it for for anyone, uh, but it, it's such a different um, different take from the from you know when we're we're talking about the Odyssey and we're talking about anything uh, the Iliad, and uh, it, it was something that I I just really wish that I was, that was around uh, when I was studying. So. Um, well, and I think you're right. I mean, it, it's one of those things like when I saw that, that Chaz had written this, I was yeah. like, wait, do I know the story? And I looked it up, I'm like, I, I remember it. But the one I tell in the myth class is the one that Erica didn't want to mention, right? Which is the dirtier version of Laodamia <laughs> and the statue, um, which is really a product of, of Greek misogyny. Right, um, really not thinking about her as a person, but her as a, as a woman absent a man, um, which I think is not what we're going to get in this play. Right. Um, so, so before we, yeah. Yeah, before we turn to the music, Bettina, any sorry to the play, would you like to talk about your creation of the music before uh, and what went into it? Um, well, so I was given the music uh, written by, by Kim, and I was excited because it was originally written for uh, for the cello, and they asked me to do a harp, and I thought, wow, I like never get asked for the harp. They asked me for the lyre usually, right? And I thought, a harp, okay, this is exciting. I finally get to do it. And uh, and it's wonderful because it, it the, the harp, what it does is it gives like a bigger spectrum of feelings in many ways, mm -hmm. because we have the, you know, the higher notes and the lower notes. And so when it comes to like, oh, here's the war part, strumming. Um, so you you get that that feel of it, what I, I hope I was trying to convey. But when it comes to the, the my, my favorite parts was like, and now it's springtime. And there's just these lovely melodies and nice, like you, you hear the, the prattle of almost of spring, like actually like a spring streaming and things. And I thought it was just so, so well done. And it's, um, I was explaining to my son that what mama is doing 
is I'm, I'm playing background to like, if you, you can imagine a movie, because he hasn't been to a play where there's like music in the background. I said, that's, that's what I'm doing. Or if you can imagine a ballet and you couldn't imagine a ballet. So I said, fine. <laughs> okay, so let's go back to like a play where there's just, you know, just a little bit of mood music going on, just enough to, um, to make the, the, the actors get a little bit in the mood, but it's not overwhelming the actors, you know, it's just a little bit of it. And uh, that's what I really appreciated about, about the music, the way it was written and why I love this, this music that I ended up playing. So I'm so grateful. Thank you, Kim and Chaz for letting me be part of this. It, the music was very sensitive and I felt for this particular play, that is what the music needed. So thank you. Thank you, Bettina. I look forward to hearing it. So before we move to the performance, Erica, um, any pointers of what to look for in the performance? What are you most excited about? I think um, it's, we can look forward to hearing a lot more from Lauda Mia, what this experience, experience is like for her. I think there's, there's quite a lot of play with this idea of the image as well as with fragments. So listen for discussion of fragments as well. All right, thank you. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to watch a full run of the compressed version of the play, um, and then we'll gather again at the end to talk about it with its authors, um, with the creators of the music, Kim Sherman, um, and perhaps some of the actors who join us. So without any further ado, um, Chaz Libretto and Kim Sherman's uh, The Loud to Meet. tell the families immediately. The messenger gives the news, and then he goes to meet with an officer. Sometimes they bring a priest, too. There's a system in place for how it's done nowadays. They come to the house, they wait outside a moment, and they look at each other. How will it play out this time, they wonder. How will the news be taken? There's a moment before they knock on the door when they admit to themselves that this moment is quite a lot like the moment before combat begins, before the doors come down on the boats, before the whistle is blown. There's a quiet, a hush. And then they knock on the door and it's answered by a wife or a husband or a mother or a father. And that person, that wife or parent or husband, well, they look into the eyes of the messengers at the door, and that loved one knows everything before the words have left the mouth. Your husband was killed in the service of his country. My husband is... He's not coming home. He's never coming home. Don't you see? He's never coming home. No, he isn't. They took him from me. They murdered him. I don't want to live if he's not here. No, daughter. I want to die too. No, no. Stay with me for a while. Come home with me. I can't, I can't, I can't do that. I'm a grown up father. I can't just move back into my childhood room with all my childhood things. I can't do that. Just for a little while. It's my fault. I knew this would happen. It's, it's all my- Daughter. You don't understand. I do. I do, daughter. There were times when you were young, when I, Revisit your mother's last hours over and over in my head, trying to understand, trying to change things, trying to see where I could have done things differently. And let's go inside. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
There's comfort sometimes in doing familiar tasks, especially on days like this. It keeps the mind from the would-haves, the should-haves, the story fragments, the other paths, the counter worlds, where things were different. I hope you bring better news than the last messenger, traveler. I am not a messenger. I am Podarsis, son of Ith Ithocles, brother of Iolaus. I travel from Phylis at the request of the king, my father. The lord of many sheep. Is the news true then? I'm afraid it is. And his house half built. No children. How is she taking it? She wanders the house in her wedding dress and in her wedding crown and in the shoes her mother wore at her own wedding. Hello, King. It, it, it cannot be. Oh, children, how can you beguile men's hearts? It is unlawful for one who is polluted to be in contact with this house. No. You mistake me for my brother, King. He rightly called you father-in-law since you settled your daughter on him. For a moment, I thought a ghost had come to inhabit my house. You know then? My father would like to discuss funeral arrangements. Your brother's body is at Troy, but we will commemorate his life here in this country tonight. Father. Who? Oh. How? It's all right, daughter. You know him. But, but they, 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 they told me that you, that you had... Oh. Oh, you're not him. Are you? No. We met at the wedding, didn't we? Yes. Though you met a lot of people that day, so I can certainly understand if you don't remember. I remember every moment of that day. Can we have a moment, please, Father? Of course. Uh, Podarsis, thank you for coming <laughs> today. I thought you were him. You're not the first person to make that mistake. I'm his wife. <laughs> It has been a long, terrible day. Endless. I haven't been able to sleep since he left for Troy. Not well, at least, since he, before he left. Actually, I, I've worried so much, and I think today is the worst day of my life. Mine too. I feel myself fragmenting. Parts of me are going away. I remember this feeling. I, I remember when my mother was, when I was young. God, what do I do? Help plan his funeral. No, 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 I, I, I can't. To deny death is a dangerous thing. But after the funeral is over, and there are no more letters to be read when the, when the tasks are all done. Well, what do I do then? Live. Remember him. And but keep living. Bury your wedding crown with him. It will help. There's nothing of him to bury. If he hadn't come here, if we'd never met, he'd still be alive. He should be alive today. Phyllisy would have fought in this war, regardless of your marriage. But it's so small a country. They wouldn't have noticed him. The, the, the generals, Odysseus and Agamemnon, they, they'd have ignored him. Don't blame yourself. You look so much like him. I shouldn't have come. No, I... Please, I, I'm... I'm glad you did. Uh, I'm sorry. I should go. Wait. Do, do you know if... Was my husband the first? The 
the first? The first to die. I can't imagine there was any, anyone counting. But, um... They say there were many casualties in those first moments when the boats began to land. But did his, his feet touch the ground first? I can say. Why do you ask? I had a dream. A dream? That he would be first. Hey, Demea, please. This can't help. You mustn't blame yourself. Even if there was anything to this dream, fate isn't something you can stop. But what if it wasn't his fate? The dream didn't say if this first fated would be my husband or if it would be Odysseus. Odysseus still lives. And your husband is dead. But what if it was a mistake? What, what if Odysseus was intended to die and, and, and my husband- Listen, just... what you have said is nothing strange. That a mortal should suffer misfortune. The gods do not make mistakes. It has been decided. A tomb will be established at Phyllisi, and we will commemorate his memory another way here. They are saying he was the first to die, slain by Hector himself as he leapt from the boats. Tesselius, faded first. I will begin preparations at once. How? The body lies in Troy. There can be no procession, nothing to inter or, or anoint or cremate. Immortality lays in our continued remembrance. You give up on him so easily. What would you have me do? Would you rather no funeral took place at all? Son, <laughs> leave the funeral preparations to the women and old men. I'm afraid you are wanted on the front. You now as well? and every man. I hope to fight as bravely as my brother, and to die like him too, if such is my fate. Laodamia sank deeper and deeper into darkness those first weeks. She wept, and the gods drank up her tears until she didn't have tears left to give. But still, she drove to do as Iolaus's brother had asked and remember her husband, though this action cost her deeply. Daughter? Did you say something? I said recruitment is up. I have approval to build a memorial to your husband. He'll never be forgotten on these shores. Oh. It's good. Yes, I think so. His bravery will inspire us for generations to come. I'm glad there is purpose to this. You should eat. I'm not hungry, Father. I, I, I wish I were. I'm just, I'm not hungry. Her sleep came fitfully when it came at all. And perhaps this was a blessing. For the dreams which visited her when she did were most unpleasant. Could she have done something? Had she tried hard enough to keep him here, to save his life? There's a spiral to questions of this nature. They begin in a logical place and they end somewhere else. Her guilt and her grief infected her every moment. And so, it was decided by some among the gods and that for a few short hours the first widow could indeed say goodbye to her husband if only in her dreams from the fountain iolaus appears bloody and horrible to view he lurches forward confused pale and forlorn from here on he is known as protesilaus <gasps> Oh, horror. Am I? Did they? Yes. 
did I? Is he? Is the disease safe? You know he is. And I'm. Who am I? What am I? Protesilaeus. Oh. I was resting. I was asleep. Why am I here? It's not the place of gods to answer to mortals. Mortal. Yes. I am mortal. I am mortal. So why am I here? It's so loud of you. That's our house. We live there together. She, she must, d d don't bring me there. Please, d don't let her see me like this. I, I beg you, please. Steady, steady. Just follow me as I lead you, son. Come. What fears you a house when you have faced death itself? Who, who, who is that? How? She runs to her husband and embraces him. Husband! Oh, husband! I will never let you go again. It will be as it was before, and 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 I, I will be so good to you, the best wife you can imagine, and and we will be so happy and I cannot stay long. You can't. Well, it was it was all so brief. Mortals are much deceived by groundless hopes. You're so cold. I have suffered such things as awaits you and everyone. What did it feel like? You cannot imagine it. I'll try. If you'll let me, I, I want to know. I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry that I wasn't there. Please tell me what it felt like. No. Please. You don't wish to know. I do. Like, I was filled with tiny hopes. All leaking out everything important about me. And the holes kept opening and up. I, I, I kept trying to, to, to plug them, but there were too many. And I was losing everything there was about me. Faster than I could think, faster than I could feel, faster than I could realize. Soon I was pouring out of myself. I was coming out of the holes too. I was fragmented. And, and, and I could see myself, but I was becoming far away. I was leaving myself through the tiny holes. Are the gods, are they children? They are the gods. Why did it happen this way? It was my duty. I tried to keep you here. Yes, you did. There's no reason to it. Do you look for someone to blame? Yes. Then blame fate. Fate. My thread was spun from the beginning. I lay it. I oh, lay it. What? That's my name. It's always been my name. But I, I, I thought I, I don't understand. You said, I, th I, I thought it was, it was the general. I thought it was Odysseus. I thought he would be first. Protesilaeus. 
faded first. You you said it was him. You 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 said that. That's what the, the dream meant. I... Did you ever truly believe that? Why did it have to be you? Why not the general? They didn't tell you. Tell me what? They should have told you. Please. Odysseus was indeed the first to land. But he threw out his shield and it landed on the sand. And he leapt forth and his feet touched his shield and not the Trojan beach. Long enough for someone else to be the first. Oh. Why Leo Decius? I don't understand how this could happen. You shined your light upon me for all to see. The princess of Iocus and her sheep lord, your pet sheep. That's all I was. No. They saw me that way too. The generals, a sacrifice. They sent me to the front to slit my throat upon those savage swords. I'd be alive if we had never met. But that's fake for you. My time is up. Goodbye. But I am, I'm not ready. Whoever is, but my time is up. Let me come with you. It may not be. It never has been. What good did this do? It was never my choice. Farewell. What happened to you? Why won't you be yourself? What is that? The man I married. would never have come home, even if he had lived. What, what, why would you say that? Please stop speaking in riddles. Please. My husband loved me. He told me that when he left, when, when he got on the boat, he, he said- That person that, would have been lost. Lost to me. Lost to you. Lost to the world. War would have destroyed him, even if he had lived. It is better this way. No, you're so good, so understanding. You, you are a loving man who listens, who, who... I was, and perhaps I would have remained so, had there never been a war, and had I never been asked to go. Yes, you loved me. He did. I know that. That man who went to Troy. That man who kissed you on the docks. Iolaus. He loved you. But if he had survived, he would have forgotten the fucking meaning of that word. Thank you for coming today. It means much to my family. For though this statue is carved to look like my son-in-law, I believe it will come to represent all who fall in the coming months. And we will remember them. They shall not see the twilights of their lives as we that are left will do. The years shall not tire them. At sunset we will remember them, and at sunrise we will remember them. 
We were optimistic to think this war over so fast. And we ask now to send more men to help win over there. Still, I am hopeful the war will be over by the end of <laughs> next winter. I believe we can accomplish that. But for that to happen, we must continue to do our part, and more of our brave men must go to Troy. Our commitment to the mission endures. I will not allow Troy to be a safe haven for those who would attack our friends, or us. For those same villains who stole the wife of Menelaus have done the same to my daughter's husband. And unlike Helen, he will not be coming home again. Remember him. Remember them. The chorus pulls the tarp from the structure. A lifelike statue of Ioleus is unveiled. Born Ioleus of Philosy. Protesilaus the first, but not the last. We will remember them all. Come, daughter, let's go home. Not yet. Oh, it grows cold. Don't stay long. I won't. I, I just, I just need a minute. Can you give me that? Of course. You look so much like him. Almost like you could just take a step and walk away with me. Or talk. That's all right. I don't really have much to say. But I don't really wish to go anywhere either. I am. Um, I can just stay here a while with you, if that's all right. It's so quiet here. Do you like this spot? He's got a nice view of the ocean. really uncanny you, you look you like you look like more like yourself than than the one who came back did i suppose i dreamt that did i dream it it, it felt so real but how can the dead return to talk to us we talk to them it's not the other way is it i am um, it's all very confusing. It's getting cold. Oof. I guess I can't ask you for your coat, can I? You're not cold, are you? It's practically spring. They said the war would be over by now, but it's not. It's cold for spring, don't you think? I miss you. I really, really miss you. <gasps> Thank you. That's, that's, that's sweet of you to say. I feel as though I've let myself go a bit. Oh, my hair's a mess. Oh, well, that's, that's very, um, I'm glad you still feel that way. I, I do too, in case you were wondering. It has been a while since we've been out together. So you are free? All right, that's fine. We don't have to go. I don't particularly want to go, if I'm being perfectly honest. I just, we just haven't been out very much since you've been home, and no, I know. I know, I just, I want things to be normal. I, I want them to be the way that they were, and, and it's silly. They can't, of course, I, 
I realize that. I think it changed you. I think you're you're different than before. I just it all just takes some getting used to. Yes, for both of us. Oh, don't get me wrong. It's for both of us. Of course it is. But I, I, look, I'm just going to say something here. And and look, please don't don't take this the wrong way. I just I've been doing a lot of thinking. And the truth is, I just don't think we knew each other all that well when we got married. We were so young. We are so young. Maybe we, maybe we rushed. We, we, we didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. And no, 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 of course I want to stay married. Of course I do. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. I, I want us to work harder to, to, to try to find again that the thing, that, that reason why we fell in love in the first place. Is that, is that so terrible? I, I don't mean it to be. I, I just, what I mean to say is, let's use this as an opportunity. Hmm? Let's, let's get to know each other again. Let's, Let's go on a holiday. The lights brighten. It's a summer's day. It's warm today, isn't it? I love summer here. We hadn't met last summer, but oh, I remember how beautiful the boats all looked sitting in the harbor. They're all gone now, of course. The city is empty. She rests her hand on him and pulls it away quickly. Oh, you're hot. Oh, you are a bit overdressed for today. Thank you. Why don't you take your coat off? I think you'd be more comfortable with it off. Give it to me. I'll take it for you. Well, don't listen to me then. I'm only your wife. I just want you to be happy. The light's cool. It's fall. Happy anniversary, husband. Oh, what a year. I love fall, don't you? <laughs> the trees are beautiful. I love you so much. Oh, it's getting cold again. Winter's going to be hard this year, I think. I should, I should probably find a coat to wear. You used to offer yours so readily when we first were married. Don't go anywhere. A castus comes to the courtyard. He looks at the statue and he gets a tool out. He starts to loosen the statue's legs. Father! What are you doing? Where are you going with Iolaus? A walk! We are going for a walk. Together? Yes, that's right. I, 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 I don't, I don't think. Um, you're, you're, you're not, you're not going far, are, are you? I, 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 I don't know that that you should um take. Uh, when, when, when are we, When are you coming back? Maybe, maybe you should. Um, uh, daughter, just hold on one moment. All right. I have felt that your husband and I. We have noticed that lately you've been a bit... How have I been? Well, I, I thought I... We thought we'd get flowers for you. Flowers? But I, I, I don't need flowers. Uh, oh, well, I, <laughs> he just wants to get you some just the same. <laughs> He does? Yes, oh, yes, he does. And he suggested we go together because he didn't know what kind to get. <laughs> oh, that's so... 
Well, it's 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 wonderful to see how close you've become. Yes, we are very close. <laughs> I mean, there was a time when I wasn't sure if if you even liked each other, <laughs> and here you are going out as friends together. Yes, here we are together. <laughs> but uh, wait, hold on a moment. It wasn't that at all. I always liked your husband. All right, fine, 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 fine. But well, let's be honest. You didn't completely approve. <laughs> <laughs> what I didn't approve of was the speed at which you... <laughs> uh, I said it then. I don't need to say it again. All right, father. And to be honest, I thought, well, I thought he was a bit provincial for you. Was? I, not was. That's not what I mean. I, I mean, he's still provincial, but I don't care anymore. <laughs> no, that's not what I mean. I, what I mean to say is it matters less to me now. You should rest. You spend so much time out here and... I, We'll be back soon. You promise? Yes, of course. Don't you worry about that. I love you. I love you too, daughter. Husband, why do you stay so silent? You, you are so quiet on matters of the heart. You do, don't you? You do still love me. You did once. I know you did, so please say it again. Say you love me. Tell me that you love me, please, please. Just, just tell me. Don't go without telling me. Please, please, please. Oh, I heard him. I just heard him speak it. You did? He whispered it. Oh, I, 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 di I didn't, um... I, I don't think he's feeling well today. He's not? No, um, that's another reason we're going, for some air. There's air here, isn't there? Oh, he says he wants to see the mountains. Come back soon. Of course. <laughs> Stop! <laughs> what? What? What is it? What? It's been... Husband, um, are, are, are you hurt? Why do you move so funny? Is, is it your back? Did you hurt your back? Did you hurt yourself? Are you hurt? You should be more careful. You really should. Accidents happen so easily. It happens so fast and, and you're not a boy anymore and you have to watch out and you, 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 you just, you have to. Daughter. Yes. Your husband is buried at Troy. This thing, this object here, that you call your husband is not. It is not a person. It's not real. It's a mockery of real. <laughs> Don't say that, father. <laughs> It's the truest thing I have said this entire war. Please. Please don't say that, please. I am going to destroy it. It's not right. It's cruel. No! Please! Daughter, I have to. I have to. Your husband is dead. No. He is dead and he is never coming back. Stop! Please. Please. Stop, please. My marriage, please, just, 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 just let him, let it last a little longer, please, just, please let me have one more night with him, please. You know I can't. No, 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 no. She goes to her knees and pulls on the statue's legs. It begins to fall over. Uh, no! Huh? What is, what is this? Uh... Oh, it's you again. Yes. Who are you? I'm the chorus. Um, I'm, 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 I'm very worried. You're not the only one. My husband, Aeolus, he, um... Uh, Protesilus. Yes. Him. Um, he, he, he didn't, 
he didn't seem himself when he visited i i mean he seemed hurt he didn't seem well nor do you he's dead wait um he's dead no. laodemia no 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 listen to me i need to help him i need to see him i will not forsake a loved one even though he is lifeless Very well. She touches Laodamia's face. Hello? Where am I? Hello? What is, is this? It feels so familiar. I. It's meant to. So empty. Some lights begin appearing in the distance. What are those? I, I, I don't like them. They're newcomers. Newcomers? The newly dead from Troy, mostly. Your husband was the first, but he is far from the last. Where is he? Not here. Not anymore. He has traveled further. Am I dead, then? This is the underworld. Those lights look familiar. They're beautiful. Yes, they're meant to look that way. That's, they're what everyone sees at the end. Can we go to them? You could, but you'd never come back. Come. Where are we going? Let's get warm up. It's no longer an empty space. It's paradise. Oh, it's so warm here. What is this place? I, I like it here. Most who find themselves here do. It's the Elysian Field. Oh, the Island of the Blessed. Well, this is where the heroes end up. Surely my husband is here. He's not, is he? No. Where are all the heroes? There are less of them than you'd think. Even here. But in the stories. I... Mortals tell stories. Where else could he be? There's one place left to try. The lights get colder. I don't like it here. It's cold. I don't like this place. It wouldn't be what it is if you did. Everyone who enters Hades must go alone. Do you wish to continue? Yes. You're brave. She doesn't she belong doesn't here. Belong. Doesn't belong. Doesn't belong. She doesn't belong. She doesn't belong here. Doesn't belong. She doesn't belong here. She doesn't belong here. Please don't leave me. She doesn't belong here. Why is she here? I'm going to be in so much trouble for this. Why is she? Life's got even cooler. Hello? Ilaeus, are you here? Oh, it's so cold here. I've never been so cold. It's like I, it's like I'll never be warm again. We've been down here for years. That's what it feels like. I've been cold for centuries. How long has it been? A thousand years? Ten thousand? Please tell me how long it's been. How many years have we been down here? We just arrived. Oh, this was a mistake. She notices that a field of stars has opened up. It is though she and the chorus are walking through the universe itself. So many lights now. So many dead. What is she doing? She doing? She doesn't belong here. What is she doing? What is she doing? She doesn't belong here. 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 I can't see. I can't see anything. Where are you? She doesn't belong here. There's one more place she's on. What? I can't hear you. Where are you taking me? You see the gates? You see that gate? I'm a She doesn't belong here. Horace vanishes. She doesn't belong here. I can't hear. I can't see. Where are you? She doesn't belong here. She's deafening. The lights are blinding until the gate closes. She doesn't belong here. Why is she? Why is she? Why is she? Why is she? Hello? Where did you go? I, I, how will I find my way out of here? I, Elias. Where are you? Are you here at all? 
Lea de Mia is alone in the middle of a vast star field, except for one figure. Chorus removes her mask. There's a middle-aged woman beneath it. Hello, Lea de Mia. Oh. I didn't, um... I didn't know you'd be here. Mother, I'm afraid. You really needn't be. This place can be lonely when you think you don't know anyone. But everyone does. You just have to find them. You got married. I did. It was a lovely wedding. You were there? He's, um, he's here. He's, he's, he's somewhere. I, I have to find him. I... Leia Demia goes to her mother and hugs her tight. Mother, after you were gone, there were days when I tried so hard not to think about you. But it was as though my grief was this stone sitting in my pocket. And every once in a while, I'd forget about it sometimes. But every once in a while, I'd put my hand into my pocket and feel it there and know that it had never left. And I've been trying to pretend it doesn't all hurt so much. At first, um, at first you think about all the memories, all, all the things you had with, all the things you've lost, and then you realize the days to come are just sprawling out ahead, and I know. It's too much. We didn't have any time at all. First you and then I lights. I... Death is only ever timely for the dead and never for the ones who go on living. I needed you. Was life so painful that, that you had to? It was my choice. It's selfish. Any more selfish than what you try to do for him? Me? I, I tried to save him. And did it work? No. But I mean, but why would I be given such a vision if I wasn't meant to prevent it? Mother moves her shawl and drapes it around Laodamia. This was on your bed. I cried and cried into this blanket. I know you did. I dreamt about a memory of you, of going for a walk out in the fields. I guess it wasn't long before you died, but we were both so happy on that day. These last 10 years, I've, I've only ever thought about your final hours in that bed. But while I dreamt, that room was far away. And on that walk, we were both so pleased. The sun was bright and we could smell the sea and you brought a blanket. Then we found the tree and sat beneath it and ate some food that you'd brought. A butterfly then landed on my nose. <laughs> it startled me, but you just laughed out loud. <laughs> I think we'll name this butterfly for you seems to do whatever it desires. <laughs> it's Laodamia from this day forth.
And when I woke up, you were gone. And I felt so scared and so confused. And I, I still am. I, I, I didn't go to your funeral. I, I, I couldn't. I, I, I didn't say goodbye. I, I didn't know how. It hurt so much. I, I couldn't. I, I couldn't go. It was easy for just to, to forget you. But you didn't forget. No. But I, I didn't wish to remember either. Laodamia, the difference is not in the forgetting or the remembering, but in how we choose to remember and how we choose to forget. I thought I could save him. He is dead. <laughs> and so am I. But you, you are alive. I am. Live. I'm afraid. It hurts. Live. <laughs> Lights change suddenly. Back to the moment when Acastus laid the statue of Protesilaus on the ground. Father. Yes. The statue fell. I know, daughter. I don't think I need this to remember, Father. I don't think any of us do. I don't want a statue. I don't want a parade. I don't need the war validated. Nor would I worship its horror. Remembering him like this, it's, it's like choosing one fragment of who he was. And, and he, he could have been so much more than this. He, he was so much more than this. She takes the blanket and throws it over the statue. She places a tiny figure at the base of the statue. He carved this for me on our wedding day. Let this be how we remember him. Let this be how we remember each and every one of the dead. And then perhaps we can start to forget too. Though his body lay buried at the beach of Troy, a tree was planted by his wife in Iolcus in place of the statue for all to remember him by. The men who left for Troy that spring were the last soldiers to leave the shores of this tiny kingdom. Laodamia's actions had saved them, but there was a cost. Of course there was. Laodamia comes out. She's older. Laodamia puts a flower down. Thessalian, Protesilaus, a long age shall sing your praises of the destined dead at Troy, the first. You have a nice voice. Oh, I thought I was alone. I know you, don't I? Just an old gardener here to keep the grasses cut at the tomb of Protesilaus. Thank you for that. You knew him? I did. Do you ever stop and think about names? Not really. I used to joke about them, my husband and I. Uh, what's yours? Laodamia. 
pretty. Person untamed. Yeah, that's what it means. My mother, she decided that's what I'd be. They say the war is over. Ten years. The first soldier. And he was ours. I should find a flower too. He was born Iolaus. That's how I knew him. It means joy of the people. It's a name happy parents would give, isn't it? Well, I've heard it was said that when we die, we often learn that God's had other names for us than the ones our mothers and fathers had in mind. Do you think that's true? Who can say what the gods or the dead have in mind? Hello, Leo Tamiya. Hello, Father. I was just getting ready to go. One more moment. Father? Yes? Can you... Could you tell me about Mother? Please? Of course I can. I was just wondering um, something. I, I was wondering. Yes? Do you still miss her? every waking moment of my life. Oh. It's like this little hole has opened up in me. And every time I think it's beginning to close, a gust of air or a memory of a laugh blows it wide open again. Does that go away? No. I thought maybe it might get easier. I've heard that can happen for some. When? End of play. That, that was a pretty remarkable and uh, both modern and sort of, of and timeless piece. Um, the, the, a lot to say about it, but, but Eric, I was wondering if, if you would um, just share some of your first responses to it. Yeah, I love um, how much this play focuses on Laudemia's experience of grief and um, at times you know the the that first wave of denial um, the struggle to um, come to terms with living after someone who's died so this this kind of difficult position of being a survivor um, and what I love too about the ending is the way that it um, it decides to go in a different direction from what we know about the mythical story of of Vladimir that she chooses to live and continue surviving. So I think that's what's really powerful about it. Yeah, and and that I mean that does part of that that important work that we we're anticipating before uh, of centering the story around her and giving her a life that is beyond that uh, uh, of her husband. Um, and you know, I, I think we can take a minute, or I should have taken a minute to acknowledge the actors who perform this in such a great way. So Jesse Canazaro, Tamika Chavis, Damian Jermaine Thompson, Renee Thornton Jr. A um, couple of them we've seen so many times before, uh, but but Jesse uh, as uh, Laudemia was just sort of um, halting. Right, and sort of inhabiting that grief and and bringing um, bringing full fledged character there. Um, what what are some are there some ways in which uh, the the script and the staging changed your view of the myth, Erica? Well, I mean, just bringing it to life in this way already gives us so much more than I think exists in in the ancient tradition, where we only have these small glimpses. 
Um, I thought I, when I was just watching it, actually, you had a different experience when I was reading the script of Acastus, the father of um, Laudamia, who was played, I think, by the actor in this almost kind of um, um, like he was not as sympathetic as I thought he was in the script, I guess you could say, but um, that he, he played it in a way that seemed like he was um, not entirely um, understanding what his daughter was going through, even though he himself had lost a spouse. And I was sort of surprised by that choice. I thought it was a really interesting choice. And I'd be interested to hear what others think about it too. Well, I think, I think it's especially an interesting choice because Renee Thornton Jr. has to work hard to be unlikable, right? Like I've seen him in lots of other performances and every time I'm like, I just kind of want to hang out with that guy. But I think you're right. Like there, there was nuance to the character here. Yeah. And part of what it reminded me of um, was the sort of different layers in the gendering of grief in different cultures, right? How do we process loss? How does it characterize us and shape us? I'm wondering, I don't know, my first thought is perhaps this is sort of a depiction of, of differences in the way men and women ex explore loss and how in the ancient world, you know, it might be expected um, to be, have a different valence, especially since women are given so much authority over the, um, over the realm of, of, of lamentation in Greece. Yeah, and I think it's also the case that we just don't really hear a lot about Acastus's experience of it either in this play, which I think is a, a good choice because it focuses us on Laudamia. Um, but he's kind of there mostly in a public role where he's, you know, dedicating the statue and, and then later trying to detach Laudamia from it um, because she's developed this kind of unsettling relationship with the statue. And so I think because of that, we just get a very different sense of his of his character. So I, I think um, because of the way we put this is put together, we don't have all the actors with us today. But but Chaz and Kim, if you want to unmute and put your video on, we could ask you about it. Um, so Chaz, I, I'll put you on the hot spot if you're there. Um, so I mean, reading when I read the summary, sorry, I have a, a little baby here who's making some noise, wants to get in on the game. When I read the summary. Of, um, of the play by Euripides, I think that Acastus is gonna be a Creon type father, right? Like a pretty like, bad dude is ruining things. Um, what was going in your sort of recreation of this figure? Yeah, um, I mean, he has to do a kind, of a, a kind of challenging thing in that he has to both be there for his daughter and also kind of be an antagonist to his daughter uh, in the story because um, I mean, his job, in this play, at least, is to is to keep sending meat into the thresher, really, and and um, and therefore weaponize uh, the memorialization of his daughter's husband, and um, kind of weaponize grief. Um, and I think the kind of the crux is is eventually seeing what that grief has done to his daughter is kind of where he has to flip and and choose between um, supporting this war or supporting his daughter. So when you were putting the play together then, you really saw their responses and processes of grief as being complementary or at least in conversation with each other. Yeah, I mean, kind of in, in conflict with each other a little bit because there's, um, you know, not to say that there's a, there's a right or wrong way to grieve, uh, but, I, I do think that um, there is a way of uh, politicizing grief and, and using grief uh, to keep wars going and keep keep conflicts going. Um, I mean, you see war memorials all over the world are often um, staging points for right-wing violence and, and uh, fascist movements. Um, and, and so they're not always used uh, for benevolent purposes. Um, and I, I sort of felt like there was something an interesting conflict between between uh, memorializing someone for nefarious purposes and, and not that he's necessarily thinking in those terms, but he's certainly thinking that he has to send more troops to Troy. And I think the way you're putting it, so the, the politicization of memorialization, I mean, it's as true for ancient Greece as it is for today. If we go around and look at 
Civil War monuments, sure. 9-11 mo- memorials and those types of things. And the way we separate the year. Um, Jesse, yeah. we're so glad you joined us. Um, I think that from what I've seen in comments, your performance um, really floored people. Um, oh, thank you. I couldn't watch. I can't. I can't watch myself. <laughs> so I, I. But I'm. I'm grateful to Chaz for writing such a, such a beautiful play. Um, I'm grateful to be to be here. Thank you for having me. So I was wondering if you could maybe share with us what it was like becoming Laudamia and some of your thoughts and sort of points in the play where you really identified with or struggled with your character. Yeah. So I know it's a great question. Um, I. Uh, she is she goes on such a journey and it's been really interesting I, I think when did we first do this uh when did I first join it must have been 20 2016 2016 um so as Chaz has I'm sure already talked about that the play has gone through such a, a a journey but um the core of her character has has always been there which is this person struggling to I uh, to both love and remember uh the people she's lost but also not let that grief overwhelm her. Um, and I think it's certainly something that I can relate to. I think so many of us, especially over this last year, um, we've all lost something and we've all lost uh, so much and it can feel overwhelming and it can feel um, difficult at times to understand how to both uh, memorialize and and keep those we have lost and and loved with us while also um not letting that grief overwhelm us and uh, i think chaz has just done such a, just a, a beautiful job with um ar- arcing that 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 story arc for her uh of of kind of coming to that place of um both the the new grief and also the grief that she's held on to for years with her mom um it, it can feel as she says, it can be too much at times. Um, but I, I, but what I, I love is is getting to that, seeing her get to that place at the end where there is hope, and you you learn to live with grief, and um, it doesn't mean that you don't that you're not forgetting the the people that you've lost in your life, but that you're learning to um, to keep them with you and move forward. And so I think that that's had, has always been something that I've really related to. And um, I think he's, you know, just done such a a beautiful job writing that. I really appreciate how you sort of center the processing of loss and how meaningful it is right now. And it really, it it makes me think of, you know, um, asking all three of you, since you've worked on this play since 2016, which we thought all thought was a bad, confusing year. And now you come back to it during the pandemic. how has living with this story and play over time changed? Uh, how has your response and engagement with it sort of de- evolved as our world has sort of taken interesting turns? Um, well, I'll say one positive thing that has changed is that um, we got out of Afghanistan. Um, and that is sort of a, you know, when this play was started, we were there, we had been there for 15 years. and. Um, and that was certainly on my mind as we were working on it was this kind of forever war, this idea that we just keep things going until we win and keep sending people there. That, that the last speech of the chorus where she talks about, um, you know, boys who were, you know, babies when the war began by war's end are, you know, fighting at age, or at least by the time Odysseus gets home, they're fighting age. In our war, they truly were fighting age by the end. Um, and so I, I'd say that that's, at least one positive change uh, that has occurred since the play was begun. Um, but, but yeah, like Jesse said, I mean, this has been a year where uh, we have all lost so much and where um, there has still has yet to be kind of a, a, a national grieving process and, and an understanding of how, how do we take stock of what has been lost. That's so true. I, I um, and it's actually you know I, I was thinking about that when we were uh, uh, rehearsing it the other day. That just the line has always been you know when when she says at the end you know they say the war is over ten years and um, obviously when, whenever we think of the, you know the, the Trojan War this this long never ending battle and um, and that that really did come into 
focus with uh, with the end of of our own even longer never ending uh, war and um, and uh, yeah I think that and that's such such a good point Chaz of that. Uh, especially in in our modern fast paced world, um, uh, with news coming so fast and with things always feeling like they're getting worse and more more things to take in, um, there can there it can be difficult to find a moment to stop and and grieve and to uh, feel like we just have to keep plowing ahead and going to work and trying to live as if everything is uh, quote unquote normal when. Um, when there's so much uh so much happening in our lives and uh i think it it so much uh, this play in particular is just a, a reminder to me that like you have to stop and 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 take a moment to to yourself to to make sure that you are grieving if you need to grieve or uh just um taking in taking taking a moment to say Am am I doing? What do I need? Am I doing okay? Um, you know, do I need to be talking to somebody professionally? Do I like what? What do I need to um, in order to not just feel like I am on autopilot um, and and setting my grief aside? Uh, but this play is, is a reminder to um, to not just push it down. And I think that that's one of the really strong things about the end of the play, the way you have, I mean, the characters who are in conflict throughout, you know, they find that common ground. In, in, sorry, <laughs> she's got commentary on this. They find that common ground in, in grieving, right? And it reminds me in part, you know, of like uh, armistices in the Iliad, when they're both going to bury and care for our dead. And that sort of recognition of shared humanity um, that I think we're too often missing. And so there's that universalizing impulse that, you know, can be seductive. And I wonder, Kim, like, we're talking about the words and the process, and you're composing this music that both has place and time and doesn't. So I'm going to pose the same question to you. How has like your music and score um, for the play changed no. with time in our experiences? Um, it's, it's interesting because it I, my impulse when I first heard about the play was to do a cello. I mean, we've done it as a reading and a semi-staged work with a cellist on stage with the actors and it becomes part of the visual and oral world of the play. And, um, and then this time putting the harp with it gave us all sorts of ideas about um, <laughs> if we ever get to do this in person um, because it was such a beautiful color to add to um, what we had. Um, so the music, what I started out doing is so almost technical. Um, I wanted to write themes for different characters and different ideas. And then <clears throat> I wrote them all out and I put them in, I wrote them in every single mode, like Locrian, Ionian, Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, Mixolydian, and Aeolian. So it's the same tune, but it's got different harmonies because of what mode it's in. Then I took all of those and I wrote them backwards and I wrote them upside down and I wrote them upside down and backwards. So that was my toolkit. <laughs> And because modes are so Greek, <laughs> you know, I just want wanted to just play with that. Um, but you know, the the initial theme is what kind of connects with the character and the play and stuff. And then just having all these different ways of expressing it depending on the scene or the mood of the scene. Um, so yeah, it, then I made I liked it so much that I made it just a cello suite out of it that was performed and that's how I record got the cello recording actually um and then um yeah so it's kind of changed forms in a way um and I keep you know every time you do something you learn something uh so now I'm imagining the underworld being totally like orchestrated because I like to I like to make the play you know like the air I think the music is kind of the air 
around the characters or something. Thank you for sharing that process because it really makes me think of the way story is shaped and reshaped yeah. in each moment. And so sort of for the final question uh, that Lana has shared with us. Um, so, so Chess, when, when you bring these stories together and you're, you're sort of innovating and recreating in a way, um, some audiences might not know, well, what's ancient and what isn't. Um, so you can talk a little bit about your process and maybe in particular the including the death of La Laodamia's mother as part of the uh, central kernel of the play. Yeah. Um... So the earliest version of this play was like a 10 minute play. Uh, it was like really a short um, kind of experiment. And um, shortly after that, kind of I felt like it was more to be done with that, with that play. Um, and so the thought of kind of beefing it up and, and kind of getting it, getting it larger, um, there had been, there's a, a reference at the end of, the ten, of, of this 10 minute play to her mother. And, and um, it felt like there needed to be something to connect uh, for somehow for her, for her to come to, to terms with her father, uh, there needed to be some kind of connection. Um, and I think in Greek myth, I, I don't know that there's anything about her mother in terms of what became of her, but um, there certainly is a fair amount about Acastus and, and that he, he took part in wars prior to the Trojan War. Um, and that uh, in the longer version of this play in, in, in the, the, the sort of two hour, two hour version, um, there's a, 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 a lot more about her and about um, Acastus's relationship with her. And, and he attempts to kind of connect to his daughter a number of times before Protesilaus leaves for Troy about the mother and, and her own kind of denial of death and denial of what became of her mother um, sort of plays into that. So if, if people want to learn more about your play, about this play, um, is there somewhere where they can go to sort of read about it and learn more? Um, I guess. I guess my website, um, but uh, it's available on New Play Exchange, where you could read the full-length version if you wanted to. Um, and uh, and keep your fingers crossed that there'll be a full-length production someday. I guess. So and, and and Lana, if you could, can you drop those URLs into the chat um, so people can see them? Um, th thank you. Uh, so Paul's here with us, Paul Omani, to tell us more about everything we're doing in the world. And he's got a Thanks, beautiful Joe. shirt on today. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. I've also I've just discovered there's a cactus in this room as well. So it's worked out really well. Um, I just want to say a really, really big thank you to Chaz, to Kim, to Jesse, and to everyone else who was involved in that production. It was just absolutely brilliant. And it's a really wonderful kind of new development for us as a series as well, create, putting on newer work like this. And it's really, really exciting. And we hope to do more of that in the future. Um, our next episode is in two weeks time, it's on the 15th of December, and it will be our 50th episode. Um, we're reaching our half century. Um, and what other way to reach a half century than with a cabaret? And we'll be performing um, various um, different uh, things as part of this cabaret. There'll be music, there'll be comedy, um, there'll be um, all sorts of uh, new and old things happening, including um, one of the first performances of a papyrus that was recently discovered and has been recently translated by Toff Marshall and Melissa Funky. Um, so watch out for that. Um, and I'm also going to say, if anyone has any requests for something that they would like, then this is your this is your chance. Um, it's sort of like a jukebox um, cabaret um, at this moment. Um, there are and there'll be more news um, in our next episode about playing Dionysus. We'll have all the details about that competition that will be launching then and will be open to students of all ages in the US and Canada um, in the new year. And, and I'll also have a bit more information about uh, an upcoming podcast that we're going to be um, releasing. Um, and for now, I think that is that is everything that I have to say. So thank you again to everyone for this amazing performance. And thank you to all of our wonderful audience for um, for joining us too. Definitely. I mean, this was another great afternoon to spend with you all. Thank you to Erica Weiberg for coming again and joining us as a special guest. Kim Sherman and Chaz Libretto for making this um, performance possible to begin with. The wonderful actors, um, our crew and producers who make all this possible, Lana, uh, Lana Coley, Keith, Ellen, Janet, Sarah, Amy, Ali, John Coley, who makes the, the posters, um, babies who keep us up at the morning, uh, night and get us going in the 
uh, in the morning um, until two weeks from now. Um, I hope you all stay safe. Uh, same time, 3 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. in the UK for, uh, for the cabaret. Um, and in the meantime, even if you say the Greek letters right, you can still get the variants. All right. So go out there, get boosted.